Hello, everyone. So who am I to be giving this presentation? I am not an expert on courthouse documents. I do not have a legal background. I can't answer questions about the legal meaning of the language that I'm going to be talking about. What I am is someone who has read through every antebellum will, estate inventory, and deed record of Liberty County, Georgia. I have a website called theyhadnames.net, African Americans and Early Records of Liberty County, Georgia, where I and a wonderful volunteer named Kathy Dillon post abstracts and transcripts of the documents that name African Americans enslaved and free. To do that, I've had to read all the records that might have named them, then boil down the ones that I find to just the essential facts for an abstract. For the ones we transcribe, I've had to learn how to read the old handwriting, and most importantly, what is standard language in these records so that I can recognize what uh, words I should be seeing. What I've essentially been doing is building a mental template of what I expect to see and what pieces of information I expect to get from the document, and then comparing that mental template with the actual document. You might want to make an actual physical template if you're just starting out with this and keeping a list of the boilerplate language you run across um, might be really useful for being able to see the words in bad handwriting. I've included a list of the words that I've seen in your handout. Now let, let me just address where to find the records. Of course, you can go to the courthouse if that's a possibility for you, but many of the courthouse records from around the country are in the collections of familysearch.org, which is an entirely free website. In your handout, I've put a link to a separate video that I've made about how to find these records. In most parts of the country, the language in these courts, court records is based on English law and custom, and so the language from county to county will be strikingly similar. But there are still differences, and I am only versed in Liberty County records. However, I'm going to show you here and in the handout what I see in the records I know about and how to build a template for the records you might see in other counties. The most important thing you can do is read through a number of records from the county you are researching. Why? Why not just look at the ones for your ancestor? Well, that's why I'm giving this talk. As I looked at an entire community's records, I realized that most of the records are just boilerplate language. I started to see other genealogists posting conclusions based on reading one record for an ancestor and thinking, say, that the phrase, my beloved wife, might mean something about the man's feelings about his wife, when it might not, um, and that a marriage settlement saying that the property the wife was bringing into the marriage should not be subject to her husband's debts, thinking it might mean that her husband was not trusted by her parents, when that might not actually be the case, it was just standard language in these types of documents. Once you see enough of them, you can just scan through the documents and pick out the meaningful parts, which are normally who did what to whom, unfortunately, rarely specifying why. I'm going to walk through the different types of records and the language you might expect to see in them. And we'll talk about how to build this mental template. I'm going to try to make this dry subject entertaining, but I am going to be showing you records that name enslaved people since my uh, area of research is in the South. So let's not forget that the people named were individuals with hopes and dreams that were crushed in the vice of American slavery. I never forget what they suffered when I'm reading the records they're named in, even though the records make slavery sound almost mundane and normal. Let's dive in, starting with wills. This is the first part of an 1812 will by Hepworth Carter in Liberty County. I want to acknowledge the transcriber. She is Joan Dowdy. Other transcriptions in this presentation will all be either by myself or Kathy Dillon. Let's go through it section by section. 
At the beginning of the will, the testator is likely to express that they are competent mentally to make this will. And of course, they think so. Uh, they may make a comment about their physical state of health. In this case, the language sound mind, memory, and understanding, knowing that it is appointed for all men once to die, make and ordain in manner, form, and following are all standard phrases that might be difficult to read in handwriting if you're not familiar with them. You can see in these examples that although these wills are essentially beginning with the same statement, declaring mental competency, perhaps making a comment on their state of health, and declaring this to be their last will and testament, they say it in different ways. These wills were all from around the same time period, showing that the, le the standard legal language can take many forms. For example, in the name of God, amen, is a common way to start, but you can see it's not always used, and it most likely does not mean anything that it's not used. There is a lot of personal information you can get from these. Newman Bradley was elderly, whatever that meant to him. Sarah M. Law was a widow, but much of the language is very boilerplate-ish, if that's a word. And if the handwriting was difficult to read, it would be useful to know the standard things that were said in these prefaces. For example, the word disposing um, in uh, of sound and disposing mind and memory might be difficult to make out if it's hard to read because it's not a word we tend to use outside of documents such as these. In the next part, testators normally expressed any particular desires they had for their burials and asked that their debts be paid. In this case, we learn that Hepworth Carter was a Mason. You can see here from this section in four different wills that there are many different ways of expressing this thought, but knowing that it's normal for these wishes to be expressed before the division of the property starts, it's much easier to figure out what's written in this section of the will if the handwriting is difficult or just being handwriting. Whoops. There's a lot to unpack here in this next part of the will, which is where the bequests start. Let's first acknowledge the name of Fanny, a woman held in slavery who is being treated as property in the same way Hepworth Carter might have left a horse, for example, to his daughter. This is a detailed bequest, so let's walk through it piece by piece. Uh, he left to his beloved daughter. Did he actually love his daughter? Well, probably, but this was standard language in wills, and you can't read anything in particular into it, probably. Just be aware it was a usual thing to say. It was very nice of Hepworth Carter to tell his future descendants that his daughter Elizabeth was married to James C. Bowler. As for Fanny, it was standard in the documents that named enslaved people for there to be a reference to their issue, meaning that any future children Fanny would have would also be the property of Elizabeth Bowler. It's a horrible thought, but it was standard language and it also may help Fanny and her children's descendants figure out where they might have gone um, when Elizabeth died. When the property here says, should, oh, sorry, when the statement here says, should she die without issue, the reference is to Elizabeth Bowler. Hepworth Carter wants Fanny and any future children of hers to go to Elizabeth's husband, James, if Elizabeth was to die without children of her own. And when James died, Fanny and any children would go to his, Hepworth Carter's, other surviving heirs or their children. What would that have meant for Fanny? It me meant that she and her children might be divided among those heirs or sold so that the money could be divided among the heirs. It also tells you probably that Elizabeth and James Bowler did not have children at the time of this will because otherwise there wouldn't be the possibility of her dying without issue. But it also might just be standard language for just in case any children she did have um, died before she did. Often the bequest did not specify who would inherit after the legatee, meaning the person that the uh, person who wrote the will left property to, because that would have been controlled by the legatee's own will or marriage. You can see from these examples that the bequests are the part of a will most likely not to use boilerplate language. However, notice the use of uh, the phrase give and bequeath in many of them, very standard. If you know it's a common phrase, you can read it no matter what the handwriting. 
This part of the will is also the most useful for people in researching their enslaved ancestors. Note that Matilda has a daughter named Ellen and that Hector has been a driver, which normally was a supervisory position on a plantation, not literally a driver. Um, hard as it is to read these things, that information might not be found elsewhere or it might confirm information that was found elsewhere. Toward the end of the will, the testator will appoint an executor or executors and often will state their relationships to him, which is of course tremendously useful to genealogists. The language that means I have signed, in this case, I have hereunto set my hand and affixed my seal is also very standardized. In Liberty County, they normally spelled out the year and said which year it was of American independence. Again, if you know it's a normal thing in the county you are researching, you can see it no matter what the handwriting. Notice this boilerplate language, signed, sealed, published, and declared by the testator in the presence of us who in his presence and the presence of each other have subscribed our names. I can't overstate the importance of looking at the names of the witnesses to the will. Normally they will be relatives or neighbors or in the case of rural counties, both. You can learn a lot by analyzing those names. What's the exception to that? Remember how we said that a document would be brought into the court to be recorded? Sometimes they were actually done at the courthouse. If the person who witnessed the document had the initials NP, Notary Public, or JP, Justice of the Peace after their name, then it was likely more of a professional service, though in a small county, they still could have been a friend, neighbor, or relative. If the will was prepared and signed outside the courthouse, then in order for it to be recorded, one of the witnesses had to swear that it was his or her signature and that he witnessed the document being signed by the other witnesses. If the document was recorded long after it was written and the witnesses were dead, often someone would appear at court and swear they recognized the handwriting as being that of the deceased. Notice in this document, that it was signed by the testator in 1812, but not recorded in the court until 1815. For wills, when there's a difference between the two dates, consider that the will could be being recorded because the person had died. That might not be the case, but often it is, and it can give you a clue as to the death year because a will would normally be recorded as part of the probate process. It had to be recorded before the executor or administrator of the estate, sorry about that, uh, before the executor or the administrator of the estate could implement the provisions of the will. Also notice the abbreviation COLC after the name of E. Baker, that stood for clerk, ordinary, Liberty County, ordinary was the probate judge. Um, these abbreviations were commonly used and I have included a list in your handout. So these are the standard parts of a will, as I'll probably repeat until you're sick of it. If you're familiar with what the wills look like in the county you're researching, you'll be able to read them no matter how horribly poor the handwriting. Um, I really think some of these clerks drank and also won't misinterpret a standard piece of language as telling you something in particular about your ancestor. I'm going to repeat some of the things here that you probably all know about estate inventories, but just in case. After someone died, there would be an inventory of his or her property so that the estate could be divided to the heirs later on. In Liberty County, the court would usually name five possible appraisers, and those will be listed in a court document, and three of them would conduct the inventory um, and appraisal. As far as I can tell, they were normally neighbors who weren't relatives um, because neighbors would be familiar uh, with the current values of each item because they probably had the same things or people um, and would be more impartial than a relative would be. They would be sworn in and then they would conduct the inventory and the appraisal and submit it to the court. If all the heirs were of age, the estate might be divided right away. In Liberty County, the estate would normally be divided into lots. Each lot would be assigned a number and the numbers would often be put in a hat and each heir or their representative, a husband would represent a married female, uh, would draw a number. 
Sometimes enslaved people would be included with other property. Sometimes they would be appraised and included in separately. Uh, in Liberty County, land was rarely included in these inventories. Um, it was handled separately. If you are researching enslaved ancestors, it's worth seeking out those land transactions because it could tell you where your ancestor was held in slavery um, unless the deceased had more than one piece of land. If the heirs were not all of age, there would be a division for the ones that were and the lots that weren't drawn because the heirs weren't yet eligible would be left in the estate in the hat and there would be a separate division each time an heir came of age. It might or might not say that that division was because someone had come of age. So if there, if there was a division before and now they're doing a separate one just for one person, that probably tells you something about that person's birth date. Now this might mean it might take 20 years, say, for an estate to be fully dispersed. So you need to watch for the possibility that there might be multiple estate inventories. What happened to the estate in the meantime if it wasn't dispersed? In the case of enslaved people, they would often be kept on the plantation under the management of an overseer who would often be a relative of the deceased. A note from Liberty County that might apply elsewhere for the date of the inventory. Often I see the date that the appraisers were sworn in and the date that the inventory was recorded in court without anything that explicitly says what day the inventory was performed. I really don't know if that means they did it on the same day they were sworn in or if it just didn't actually matter what day they did it. Estate inventories tend to be much easier to read than wills or deeds because the information is pretty standardized. Um, these are the pieces of information I normally pull out and abstract. One piece of information that uh, is uh, quite a clue is, does it say that there's an administrator or an executor of the estate. An executor would have been someone who was named in the will as the executor because they're executing the will. An administrator probably means that the person died without a will, intestate, um, and therefore that, that gives you um, quite a clue as to whether or not you need to look for a will if you've only found an estate inventory. Of course, they would normally say executrix or administratrix for uh, a woman. Also, if uh, the only heirs were uh, minor, uh, not yet of age, then it might say a guardian as well. The list of personal property in the inventory is of course interesting to us as descendants, but it really only tells you something in comparison to other inventories of that same place and time or if there's something obviously unusual. For example, I've seen inventories that were clearly of stock from a store, and so you would know that the deceased was a merchant, say. Inventories that include enslaved people are, of course, hugely important for their descendants. Sometimes this is the only time you will see an ancestor's name in a document if they weren't mentioned in a will or a deed record. I've looked at so many of these now that I have some tips to pass along. The term old before someone's name does normally refer to age, but you'll see in this one that there can be a wide difference. Old Seely, and that's just my guess for how that name would be pronounced, was listed at a value of minus $50, meaning that she was in such poor health and probably so aged that the other heirs would essentially be paying the person who took her. But old Harry, number 27, was valued at $300. So he was younger than her, in better shape, um, whichever. One of the most important discoveries I've made in Liberty County is that sometimes enslaved people were recorded in family order without that being stated. Uh, do you see in this inventory how Margaret, Augustus, Abram, and George are listed in descending order of appraised value? I'm sorry to put it that way. I know from my research that Margaret was the mother of Augustus, Abram, and Georgia, not George. 
Uh, she was held in slavery on a different plantation from her husband, Abram Houston. That was not always the case, and it's uh, not always even the case in, within the same inventory, but it's worth watching out for, especially if you, if you see an inventory that has a woman's name with a relatively high value, like um, Margaret here is uh, $1,000, followed by a list of people with lower appraised value and in order by value, probably indicating their ages. Um, that could be what it means. I have, I have occasionally even seen both parents listed this way with their children after them. In Liberty County, often the first enslaved person listed in an inventory for an estate of significant size will be the driver, whether, it's identified, whether he's identified that way or not. The driver was a supervisory position, as I mentioned before, not like a wagon or a carriage driver, and would often be the most important person on a plantation for the other people enslaved there. It's not always the case, but if the pers first person listed has a high assessed value compared to the others, consider that possibility. In the second example below, you, you'll see that there are two drivers and they're specified that way. And this inventory actually identifies families explicitly. Um, this was from 1808. Uh, obviously extremely valuable information for uh, descendants. And if you are a descendant of the enslaver and looking at this record, it's worthwhile to try to find some way to get this information out here, whether, whether on a Facebook group or a blog or something um, so that people can find it. Deed records are usually in the superior court records. What are they? For the most part, they are contracts between two people that were usually written and signed outside a court setting and then brought in later to be recorded, though not necessarily. This is important because they might be recorded years after the original contract and the clerk who was copying the original record into the deed book could introduce errors. Um, as a side note, notice when you're going through deed books, it's all the same handwriting until the clerk changes. Um, so if you see your ancestor's signature, it's not their actual signature. That's the clerk's um, copying of it. And of course, uh, clerks can have very varying handwritings. I remember going into mourning um, when one handwriting changed and a few pages later, I found the, uh, the will for the previous clerk, so he had died. I have found that often it seems like someone came into the court to have a particular deed recorded and they just brought with them all the other deeds they had at home that needed to be recorded. So you might see multiple deed records over many years recorded all at the same time. Um, it might mean nothing, but it also could possibly mean that the individual in all the deeds had died and his or her deeds were being recorded so they could be used in the probate process. If you're struggling with a death date and you find this, it might be a clue that you should go page by page in the probate records from around that time. Here's an example of a deed of conveyance with the essential information highlighted and the type of abstract I normally do for these, um, which is very simple. Now let's look at the actual text of the record. The language in these records is so archaic. I have highlighted some words that will be almost impossible to read in the old handwriting if you don't already know them. Aforesaid and above mentioned are synonymous. These presents is just a way of saying this document. Whereof, hereunto, heretofore mentioned, thereof, are just old ways of jamming words together. Um, behoof is the old noun that comes with the verb behoove. You know, it behooves you to do such and such. Um, and assigns is just a way of indicating the person who Samuel Jones would legally assign his rights to. In your handout, I've included a list of words and phrases. Um, and the, with the phrases, I've included some uh, jargonless English, you know, about what it, what it actually meant. And remember, I'm not a lawyer. 
In addition, note that he specified the type of currency used. The switch to dollars from pounds did not happen immediately after the revolution. Sometimes in the earlier post-revolution records, you will see pound sterling used, and sometimes you'll see pound sterling used in one record and dollars used in another record from the exact same time. So it was obviously very fluid for a while. In the highlighted section, note how many words were used to essentially say that the buyer gave him the money beforehand and therefore he has sold. In the highlighted section, the seller is just saying that he has legal title to the enslaved man named Dick and he is willing to defend the sale in court if necessary. This is very standard language and once you learn it, you can read it no matter the handwriting or however they might have slightly adjusted it. Also, as we discussed earlier, they often write out the year and they specify which year it is after independence, which is really helpful because the written numerals can sometimes, if they're written quickly, look very similar. Then at the bottom, again, you'll see the abbreviation we discussed, this is for the court official. In this case, CSCCL stands for Clerk Superior Court County of Liberty, or you might see it as CSCLC. Um, standing for Liberty County instead of Court of Liberty. Um, it's worth looking at the abbreviations because sometimes they'll record another uh, a deed from another county or place and your eye may skip, it skip over that at the beginning and you'll just notice that the abbreviation is uh, different. And I have included a list of some of these abbreviations for Liberty County in your handout that you can adapt to the county you're looking at. Let's look at a sale of land and some of the language that might be used in them. I'm going to just focus on the parts about the land since the other parts will be similar to the previous deed of conveyance. You'll see that the first part of this is pretty self-explanatory, although I do want to point out the words alien and ramais since those are really hard to read in handwriting if you're not expecting to see them. Uh, but let's look at the highlighted portion. I'm not going to read it for obvious reasons, but if you become familiar with these words, you will be able both to read them and also to know that you can skip them because it basically just means that the purchaser gets everything associated with the land. Sometimes I think about the clerk who had to write out all of these deeds. Um, what a job. This is a collateral mortgage. Uh, by which I mean a promissory note that's backed up by collateral, often enslaved people as in this case, or by land or other property such as a horse. Um, it's just like we might do our home mortgage today. You promise to pay the mortgage company X amount and they can take your house if you don't pay. In these cases, an individual or individuals would promise to pay another individual or a company or a bank an amount and then the individual would put up some property that could be taken if he or she defaulted. Just like a home, home mortgage, um, these can be complicated to read, but you can boil it down to a few essential pieces of information once you know what all the other gobbledygook says. Here's how I boiled this one down. This is just a standard who did what to whom abstract, and I added some additional information uh, that I got about how he had a loan from the bank, et cetera. Um, let's go through the language that was actually used in this mortgage and the pieces of it, which is a very standard style. In the greenish there, you'll see the first part of the mortgage, which may not actually come first in the deed bar book, and it may even be separated from the other part, which might make it hard to interpret. So that first part was the actual promissory note. John Stewart promised to pay Josiah Wilson and Uriah Wilcox $600 before January 27, 1822. Wait, it says in the penal sum of $1,200, doesn't it? Why did I say $600? The penal sum, the amount that would be defaulted, is twice the amount the person promises to pay. So if you see the term penal sum, cut the amount following it in half, to know how much the person would actually have to pay if they don't default. In Liberty County, those promissory, these promissory notes always start out with the name of the debtor, the names of the creditors, how much money is involved, and a date. Then the second paragraph always starts out, 
the condition of the above bond is that, and it specifies that the note will be canceled when the, once the debt is paid, otherwise it won't. So out of this entire promissory note with all its repetitive wording, the highlighting represents what I would take out of it. John Stewart promises to pay Josiah Wilson and Uriah Wilcox $600 before January 27, 1821. So where does the collateral piece come in? That's the second part of the mortgage, which again may be separated from the other part. Um, you notice that there is a signature probate after the first part and actually after the second part as well. So this part is the identification of the collateral that the debtor is using on the promissory note. And it's what he or she will lose in case of default. Here, John Stewart specifies that he is putting up the land he lives on and seven named enslaved people. You can see both the horror of the latter these people who will be sold at public auction if John Stewart can't pay his debt, and the genealogical value of this record. What other type of record would identify that Hannah is the mother of Bob and Hampshire and Mary of Charles, Louisa, and Joe? This might also confirm it if you've seen it somewhere else or if you suspected it from the order um, uh, uh, that they were given in, in the estate inventory. Again, we see the boilerplate language. Know all men by these presents. The receipt whereof is hereby acknowledged. Their heirs and assigns. The new legal language we see in this document as compared to the deed of conveyance, is, uh, the previous deed of conveyance, is also very formatted language that you will see over and over again in these types of records. And once you're accustomed to what they say, you can see it. So what happened when someone failed to pay a secured debt? Well, whatever or whoever they used to secure the debt was actually seized by the county sheriff and sold at a public auction at the courthouse on a certain date. Here's a transcription of the first part of that sheriff's sale record um, that was on the previous slide. Now, we've only looked at a few records now, and look how many words and phrases we already know are boilerplate language. Know all men by these presents, being in hand to me, paid the receipt of which I do hereby acknowledge, his executors, administrators, and assigns, in witness whereof I have set my hand and seal. The word assigns might be particularly difficult to uh, see if you didn't know it, because remember in old handwriting, a double S often looks like an FS. Now let's look at the new parts. The process was that the creditors would go to court and often it would name the court they went to, usually the inferior or superior court of the county. They would file a claim against the debtor or his or her estate if deceased. And if they won, a writ of fieri facius, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, would be issued that would tell the sheriff to seize the defendant's property and put it up for sale, which was normally done on certain days of the month. Fieri facius is often abbreviated as FIFA, so you might already have seen it somewhere. It just means that the sheriff had a legal document allowing him to seize property. So this record tells us that Jonathan Holden had died and that John Baker, the surviving co-partner in a business called Baker and Troop, had sued the estate and won. The sheriff seized Robin, Phoebe, and Sophia enslaved people to pay off that debt and put them up for public auction. It would have been at the Riceboro Courthouse, although this one doesn't say that. James Holmes, a merchant, was the highest bidder. And so the sheriff wrote up this deed of conveyance. And just in, as in the one we saw earlier, he warrants that he will defend Holmes's claim to them um, if it were to be challenged. You see also the court official abbreviations we've talked about previously. In this case, it's SLC for Sheriff Liberty County. And they probably drew up this document right then and there at the courthouse. So it's a justice of, P of the peace who is a witness. This is the last part of that same record, which I'm only doing separately because I couldn't fit it all on one slide. James Holmes, who bought Robin, Phoebe, and Sophia at auction, sold Phoebe separately, and he doesn't say to whom, unfortunately. 
Then he signed over Robin and Sophia to Elizabeth Holden. Remember that they were seized from the estate of Jonathan Holden. It was not unusual for someone to make the winning bid at an auction and then turn over the enslaved people to a family member of the debtor or the deceased. Um, so unfortunately, we don't know what happened to Phoebe, but we do know what happened to um, Sophia and Robin. You all know that women had few rights in the United States in the 18th and 19th century. Generally speaking, when a woman married, if she was bringing property into the marriage, it either became her husband's property to do with whatever he wanted, or it needed to be explicitly stated in a legal document before the marriage, often called a marriage settlement, that it was not his. Normally a trust would be created and two or more men would be named as trustees to manage the property. She would have to ask their permission, maybe just a formality, before any of the property was sold. It was common for a woman's parents to gift enslaved people to her in, in states that allowed slavery and land to her brothers. Um, enslaved people were portable, so to speak, so she could take them to her husband's home her brothers could use the land to set up their households. Of course, anything might be done in any individual case. The language in these marriage settlements is wild. Every synonym that can be used is used. You'll notice that this indenture, and an indenture is just an agreement between people, is between the groom, Henry D. Stone, and his intended wife's trustees, not between her and him. Sometimes it will actually be between the man and the woman. She had no legal standing in this case, even though she actually was a widow um, to enter into a legal contract. It will be stated that they intend to marry and then the property she's bringing into the marriage will be outlined. It will also be stated that any property she should obtain in the future will also be put um, into the trust. Sometimes it goes into detail about the property, sometimes um, it doesn't, but it can be a clue later on when she dies um, as to what might happen to her property. My favorite part in this one is the part at the end, um, which I will read just because <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Such other person or persons as is or are herein above mentioned, or is or are or shall be herein after mentioned in such sort, manner, form, and wise as is, and are in these presents hereafter expressed mentioned, specified, declared, and limited, and in no other sort, manner, form, and wise whatsoever. And I hate to tell you this, but we are only halfway through this document. I've highlighted some of the redundant language used here. I'm sure that it's not actually redundant. There's almost certainly a nuance of meaning to each term that means something in the law, but I don't believe it's a nuance we need as genealogists. Um, these marriage settlements that I've seen normally do agree, as with this one, that the husband gets the use and management of the property that's in the trust during their lifetimes, but then she gets to leave it to whomever she wants. Um, it usually comes to him, though, if she doesn't leave a will and if she has no children. And in the final part, there's even more weasel wording. Um, I entertain myself sometimes by imagining someone bringing a lawsuit based on a document like this, saying, Oh, any person or persons claiming to have any claim, but you didn't say pretending to have any claim, so eh, not valid. So what did it all mean? Here's how I summarized it. In the inheritance conditions um, that I just alluded to in the abstract, it would go to her children. If no children, Henry Stone got to keep it all. Very standard clause. Often there's also something about how her trust property will not be subject to his debts. Seeing that clause in a marriage settlement shouldn't be understood to mean that her parents didn't like or trust her husband. However, the part about the debts was an important clause in Liberty County and other places where planters had to take out collateral mortgages most years to finance their crops and they could go bust in a bad weather year. It was very likely that he would have debts um, that he, they did not want her property to be subject to. 
So this is one of those cases, what we just went through, where I had to go through it quickly and a little facetiously, but I am not forgetting that there were human beings named as property in this document. Tola, Dorcas, Phyllis, Flora, and Isaac, their names are important and should be remembered. Finally, we're gonna go over deeds of gift, which are relatively easy in comparison to the other documents. Why would someone document a gift? In the case of valuable property, like people being held in slavery or land, or even horses and cows, of course, it's best to document the transfer in case the person receiving the gift wants to sell, bequeath, or re-gift the property at some point. But that doesn't mean that every gift was documented in, choice, in court. Just like deeds of conveyance and other deeds, these might be held by someone for years before getting them recorded in court, or unfortunately, they might never get recorded if no need was seen for it. Here's the transcription of the deed of gift we saw on the previous page. Robert Salins married Mrs. Ann Clay in Chatham County, Georgia on December 18th, 1808. So this, this deed of gift, which was in 1809, was presumably part of their marriage settlements or just a gift. Um, often parents would give their children property upon their marriages. Um, we've already discussed that they might give enslaved people to daughters and land to sons. Grandparents would often also often do the same. People nearing the end of their lives might gift their property rather than leave it to go through the probate process, just like today. Something to notice in this deed is that it's dated 1809, but the signatures were probated in 1820 and it was recorded in 1820. That is a big clue that something might have happened in 1820 that made it worth recording a piece of paper that had previously probably been kept at home. I would look for her or him to have died in 1820. Um, this might have been part of the probate process. It's also possible that she or he wanted to sell the people or land that was given and needed to document ownership. So you might look for another deed of sale. I would also look at the deeds before and after this to make sure it just wasn't one of those cases where someone brought in a bunch of deeds to be recorded all at the same time. It's a clue to something. You just have to figure out what. Well, we've been through a lot of material and we've really just scratched the surface of the types of court records you might find and the language that might be used in them, especially in a different county. The point is the importance of becoming familiar with the records and of making a mental template or model of what you should expect to see in a record of this type and to become familiar with the types of languages that of language that will be used, especially the redundancy. So you can read it no matter how bad the handwriting and most important to avoid misinterpreting something as being particular to your ancestor when it's just boilerplate language. To do that, of course, you're going to need to read more than just the record for your ancestor in the original source. But once you've done that, it makes reading the record so much easier. And you might actually find your ancestor mentioned um, in, in another document that you wouldn't have suspected. As I mentioned, I have put the text of the, uh, on the slides in the handout, along with a list of words and phrases commonly seen. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions now, and you're also more than welcome to use the email address here to contact me later.